surprise him. So we're hoping that we're going to give you some of those tips before the end of the show. But right now, I'm joined in studio by Dolly Mungai. Hi, Dolly. Hi, Amina. How are you? I'm good. Welcome to Nairobi, girl. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, for our viewers who do not understand more about fashion, in as much as I would love to explain it to them, I feel like it would be best coming from you. What does Dolly Mungai do? What does Dolly Mungai do? Great question. First of all, Dolly is Dolly. That's just to begin there. And I am a personal shopper. So what a personal shopper does is I come to your closet, I go through your wardrobe, I say, Amina, don't wear this, don't wear that. I look at your shoes, I say, don't wear this, don't wear that. And I replenish your whole closet. So basically, wow. I replenish your whole closet. So you go pick out the clothes. Oh. So you have like a session with me to understand like my limitations, my style, you know, my what I'm comfortable with. And then you go out. Do you go with me? Or no. Or you just go by yourself? No, I go by myself. But some, some, some clients come with me, but most clients choose not to. I'm trustworthy, so they just leave me to it. Okay, so you have an accent yeah. from the UK. <laughs> yes, from the, from <laughs> so the UK. You moved, you moved when you were how old? I moved to the UK when I was 18 months, and I'm 32 now, so practically I've lived in United Kingdom all my life. So, but yeah, but, but really and truly, I'm still Kenyan. Mm. Did you always knew you were going to come back? I always knew I was going to come back. We always come back home. That's true. We that always is. come back home. Home's yeah. where the heart is. Yes. No matter where you go. Very true. East or West, <laughs> home is best. Oh, exactly. So where did this relationship with fashion begin? My relationship with fashion began when I was, I would say, like five or six. You know when children would go shopping with their parents and they would go to the toy section? Not Dolly. Dolly would be at the magazine section. So my mother always knew where to find me. So that's where my love for fashion started. And fashion for me is like an open canvas, you know? It has no limits. You could wear red, you can wear orange, you can wear purple. There's no limits for fashion. So I think that's where my love for fashion came because there was no rights or wrong. Mm. Now I know for a lot of people they start working when they're much younger in the West. When did you start working? I started working actually when I was actually 16. I started working initially when I was 60, but started my own business when I was 20. Look at you! Yeah. Okay, so at 16, where did you start from? What, oh, what were you doing? Uh, when I was 16, I worked in Royal Mail. I don't know if you guys know what... Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I worked for Royal Mail with my aunt, which was terrible, I have to say. I had to wake up so early. I hated the job, but it gave me work experience, but I would... It wasn't for me. Yeah. Put it that way. <laughs> so you found out by, like, before you were 17, you were like, this is, this, yeah, I'm not going to do this. Running around, this is, doing this, yeah. uh, up and down these stairs, yeah. being on a computer was <laughs> definitely not me. I was always the child that you tell to do something like three, four times. Yeah. So it was definitely not for me. Yeah. So did you, you know, what did you love, though, about, like, the royal family? To be honest with you, Amina, right, I have zero... <laughs> Interest, interest in the royal family. <laughs> I should I shouldn't say that being partly sort of British, but I have no interest in the royal family. Not, at all. I, not at all. So not, you're not following like when Prince Harry left. No, and, no, and, all that all that drama. No, yeah. no, I didn't follow I didn't <laughs> I did not follow it, I'm afraid. No, it's, I didn't I didn't. So I understand that when you were nineteen, I believe you started working at Harrods? Yes, Harrods. If it for everybody who's at home should Google Harrods. Harrods is one of the most amazing stores. It's like when you walk into like a candy store, it's just so amazing. It's just like as soon as you walk in, the smell, it has food from all over the world. It has fabrics. It's just such an amazing store. It's my, it will forever and always be my best store in the world. How long did you work there? I worked there till I was 21. Oh, okay, so yeah, for two years. Yeah, yeah, I worked there till I was 21. What did you learn? Like, what, how did it impact your introduction into becoming a fashion entrepreneur? Well, what it did was, because um, Harrods, a lot of people who are quite affluent go into Harrods. So it gave me an insight of, like, fashion in that way. So it was almost like a fashion runway when I worked there. So um, that's, yeah. So it gave me a fashion insight on working in Harrods. I would see loads of people walking up and down, and I also worked in the personal shopping department. Mm. Yeah. So you ended up working with a lot of famous people. Yeah, I did. I, like did. I did. I did. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. I worked with a lot of famous 
uh, people. My career started uh, when I worked with uh, Crystal Palace because my mother lives in Crystal Palace. So I shot for the Crystal Palace football team. I helped them with their wardrobes. And then I moved on to Victoria Beckham. And then I moved on to Pub Bar. And then I moved on to... Hold up. Wolan Shatter. <laughs> Wolan. Holan, Holan, yeah. Holan, 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 Holan. <laughs> you, what? You, like you met him in person? Yes, yes, yes. I and met. he was like, Dolly, please go shop for me. No, it was more like, Dolly, <laughs> what can you do for me? It was more like that. S'il vous plaît, Dolly, merci. S'il vous plaît. Oh, my God. Yeah. Are you kidding me right now? How did you meet Pogba? Um, so I worked when I was. Um, dealing with the Crystal Palace football team, mm -hmm. I got introduced to Pogba because he had just moved to uh, play for Man United, and then I was his personal shopper. Stop it! So when you say you worked with like you know the footballers from uh, Crystal Palace, you worked with like the team. Like, no, what basically the was if, if they if they wanted anything like mm -hmm. for example like Air Jordans or like a certain jacket that was out of stock, I would always be able to source it. And the reason being, working in Harrods, see, I, ha I was in the heart of, of like fashion. So I made really good connections with people to be able to know what the new drop was. So I could always get the new things for them. So that's how it started. That is wild. Yeah. All right, carry on. Who else? Who else? Sorry, I interrupted. Okay. But that's who else? A, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Um, uh, Dan Gotte is monk, is is. My person, I shop for him, uh, Farusha Alikija, who's the richest woman in in the world, richer than Oprah, Are you? and the list goes on. What, so, like, when you meet them, is it intimidating, or did it stop being intimidating a while back? It stopped. It stopped being intimidating when I worked in Harrods, and you had to spend twenty five thousand to have a personal shopper. It stopped being intimidated then. So that's almost three million Kenya shillings yeah, that you had to drop to, to, to have a personal shop on one shopping shop spree. On one shop. And if you weren't doing that, then. And how did you like progress to become a personal shopper? Like how, what did you have to achieve? What did you have to do? Re mainly what I had to achieve was rapport building. So oh. when clients would come in, I would build rapport with them. I would understand what their needs are, what they like, what they don't like. And then that will help me build my relationships with my customers. Mm. Oh wow! So, what about acad academics? I mean, did you always know this is how you you know this is where you'd end up? I I always knew that I would end up doing something with fashion because fashion has allowed me to travel, has allowed me to live, live. How can I explain? Live comfortably. I always knew I wanted to do fashion, but I always, on the other hand, because I'm dyslexic, I always knew that I wasn't going to pursue academics. So I always just went into, I sh completely didn't waste any time. I didn't go to college or anything. I went straight into fashion. Mm. How did dyslexia affect you in your earlier years? Um, I think dyslexia affected me by not knowing that I was dyslexic because, you know, out of 10 people, four people are dyslexic and they don't know they're dyslexic. So I'm sure in your phone book, you probably have 15 or 20 people, probably more, that are dyslexic and they don't know. I'm just, I would just like to say that I have been fairly lucky that I grew up in England and it was okay to kind of be dyslexic. Mm. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, because ac being academic is not a thing. It doesn't really matter if one is academic or not in, in, in England. Mm. Yeah. Now you want to do something about that? Yeah, of course, of course. I want to come back and give back to my brothers and sisters in Kenya. I want to be able to help people who are dyslexia. And I want to be able to just to allow people to know that even if you're not academic, it's not the beginning or the end because there's so many people who are not academic, you know? Um, like, um, there's so many people and so many people who are dyslexic. Like Steve Jobs, we all use iPhones. Steve Jobs was dyslexic. Robin Einstein was dyslexic. You know, um, Richard Branson's dyslexic. Whoopi Gold, and the list goes on. So being dyslexic is nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed about mm. so that's what i want to bring and i want to bring awareness especially with parents so they can understand not to put so much pressure on their children to do well academically mm. because it's not the end all and be all, all of yeah, life exactly you can still achieve something there is still so much more to who you are than just succeeding at school exactly because there's a lot exactly. of pressure to that yeah there's there's a lot of pressure to i think to succeed academically mm. in 
in Af especially like African countries. Bro, see. yeah, you have no idea. <laughs> yeah. You have, if you grew up here, they'd be like a personal shopper. <laughs> Can she be an engineer or a lawyer or a judge or like a pilot, something? I, yeah. um, but now you're coming back to Kenya, right? Yes, so, yes, yes. I'm so excited um, to come back and live here. You know, um, I know. The, the, the grass seems always green on the other side. Everyone always wants to probably go to England, but it's so cold, it's freezing. It's like minus two right now, it's raining. So I'm so looking forward to come back and having some sun on my skin and you know, like the vibe in Kenya is epic. Yeah. It is epic. You can just sit somewhere and just watch people doing things. There's someone selling corn. There's someone trying to cross the road. In London, it's not like that. Mm. And also people are very friendly here. Mm. Very so, hospitable. So friendly. So friendly. Everyone smiles. Mm. Everyone says hi. Exactly. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. It's, it's such a culture shock. And, yeah. and people here like help you and they assist you like if you need some help. Mm. And when you go to the UK, you know, you go to a restaurant, you're waiting for someone to serve you and some restaurants are like, uh, you need to go. And, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Place your order. You need to like clean up, clean up after yourself. Self. You need to do this and do that. It's so different from what we're used to here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, just real quick, I know that there is so much you hope and anticipate to achieve here in Kenya. What are some of the things that you look for you're looking forward to um, I'm looking forward to starting my organization to help people with dyslexia and I'm also looking forward to like allow people to know in Kenya that you don't have to like wear expensive or have to like really push yourself to like be fashionable you know like Kikomba you can find so much amazing stuff if you go there so I just want to like allow people to know that you can you can like kind of like be fashionable without pushing yourself to the limit and also obviously with dyslexia because it's dear to my heart because I'm dyslexic and allow people to know that it's okay to be dyslexic. Mm, you can be fashionable but on a budget. Exactly. It's like bougie but broke but yeah, like yeah. you can still afford <laughs> no, it. Exactly, right? exactly. Now, what's so interesting is that I know that, that you can tell that Dolly has a very thick, uh, thick sorry, UK accent but this is so interesting. So she speaks better Kikuyu than she does Swahili. That's so true. How? How? Uh, I will beg. <laughs> <laughs> Stop now. <laughs> um, why do I speak Kikuyu? Because I think my parents were so, so adamant that yeah. I speak Kikuyu. Mm -hmm. uh, they were so adamant I speak Kikuyu. So I just... Jara uh, Kikuyu? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we talk to people at home. Tell them something. Tell them something. Moreega, digo conero, cacogo, moticano, and mono, monio, hanini, namunio, my, my gay. My come, Mr. Manini, I'm in the Ganya, I'm a summer, I'm a summer. At what work on your maggi? Yes. Oh, okay, so you can hear Swahili though. Yeah, I can yeah. hear, I can okay. speak Swahili, but not, uh, not that good. Not yeah. that good, not that great. In as much as you're in Nairobi, you have a business that's still running in the UK? Yeah, 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 I have a subscription business, and this is the thing that I would love, like, especially young Kenyans to know got to think of things that can help you make money while you're not there because mm. there's nothing more valuable than time there's nothing so I have a subscription business where clients pay uh, pay me a, a fee every month and I send them lookbooks and what to wear where to shop and yeah, it's it. so yeah, I have my subscription which is so, so there it is it's, yeah, a, it's, is. A, it's a whole business it's and a whole thing what are you wearing right now what am I wearing right now? I'm wearing this Chanel bag. Uh, bags? No. Ba no, it's, <laughs> it's a bag. It's a bag. So it's two bags in one. And this was from the runway 2017, which I re before Carla Lagerfeld died. So I really do love this bag. And I'm wearing Marge, some Louboutin shoes, some Chanel earrings, and some jewelry. <laughs> but welcome back to Nairobi, Dolly. Thank you so much. Best. Thank you for having me. Thank I you so much. How can people get a hold of you? What's your handle? Uh, what did Dolly wear? And what what did Dolly wear at yahoo.com? Okay, oh, so that's your email. Yes. What about your pages? TikTok? TikTok, uh, Dolly's World, Instagram. See, my mind's gone so blank. <laughs> Instagram, what did Dolly wear? 
YouTube Dolly's World. Alrighty, well, yeah. welcome back. Like well, I thank said, you so, thank you for having me. Dolly Mungai, personal shopper to the stars, darling. If you're trying to look like a mega superstar, she is the person that you wanna you wanna give a call. You wanna send that email to. All right. Now we're about to take a short break. When we get back, we're gonna be sitting down talking to BNME Baraza, okay? And Aaron Rimboy. It's all about bald men and why exactly they love better. If you're also asking the same question. We'll make sure that you stick around and come back right after this. Thank you, Dolly. Thank you. Thank you.